Hey everybody, Angry Poncho here. Woo! Welcome back to Final Fantasy X. It has been a long time since I recorded the last episode of Final Fantasy. Uh, in fact, it's been a long time since I recorded this footage. I'm doing post commentary over probably more than a month later. I can probably pull up my. Uh... Let me see if I can find it in my hard drive because I'll be able to look and see what date it's from. Let's see, recordings, Final Fantasy, episode 34, this is the first one. Properties, this was recorded, this footage was recorded on August 26th. Uh, today is November 6th. Holy shit. Okay, so it's been like two and a half months since I actually recorded the gameplay for this. And, uh, wow. The reason I waited so long is because I was waiting until I had a certain task completed that is far, far away the longest amount of time that I've spent on a video game. Possibly ever? At least as far as working on one thing. Goes. Like, I've got hundreds of hours in a few different games. But filling out the sphere grid is probably the one task that I've spent the most time on. I don't think there's any counterexamples. It definitely took longer than grinding for any Pokemon game. It definitely took longer than getting to max level in Fallout. Like, I, I, nothing. Nothing else comes to mind. Anyway, I should probably tell you what's going on. We're fighting Jumbo Flan. Or, I fought Jumbo Flan like two and a half months ago. Uh, basically, this guy's a dick. He is completely immune to all physical attacks. You cannot hit him with physical damage. There's a few ways that you can deal damage to him. You can hit him with magic, but he starts the battle with a reflect up. And that reflect... Ah, I'm trying to remember. Yeah, that reflect cannot be dispelled. So he is both immune to physical damage and reflects all magic damage. So you have to find abilities that can hurt him. So the way that I end up fighting him later on once my party is super fucking amped is uh, by summoning Aeons because their abilities sort of get around a lot of that stuff. The other thing you can do is use Overdrive to fight him. And I probably explained some of this in the previous episode because I know the last one ended with us dying to this guy. God, Mighty Guard is so good. Kimari's Overdrive sucks, but Mighty Guard in particular is so useful for... It's what, Shell Reflect and all four Null Elements, which is just crazy, crazy. So I don't know exactly what our plan is here, but one of the ways that you can defeat Jumbo Flan, and I think the preferred way, is to use the Reflect spell. So it turns out in Final Fantasy X, spells won't be reflected twice. So here I am casting Reflect on, uh, having Yuna cast it on herself. Uh, so if a spell target somebody that has reflect it'll bounce to the enemy instead and it won't bounce again even if the enemy has a reflect set up so basically I have Yuna put a reflect on herself and then any negative spells that I aim any black magic that I aim at Yuna is gonna get bounced onto the jumbo flan instead also what the fuck Oh, Lulu's double casting. I was like, why am I in menus for so long? I want to double cast, double cast Flare targeting Yuna both times, and they're both going to bounce off the Reflect and hit the Jumbo Flare. So that's how you can get around the fact that he's immune to physical damage and reflects all magic. You have to use the fact that magic won't reflect twice. And I get why that's the case, because if magic could reflect more than once, it would just bounce back and forth forever since we both have a Reflect up and the game would probably just lock up. That's no bueno. So I can see why the developers put that in, but still. It's a little unintuitive, and I don't know how you would guess that, but, you know. Not sure you can bribe this guy <laughs> as we go away. Also don't know if I would count that as winning. But we're going to beat him by double casting Flare and targeting our own uh, white mage, because, you know, she can take it. She's a champ. Holy crap, so... So, so much has happened since the last episode. Uh, my life is in an entirely different place. Things are great. I'm super pleased. 
Uh, everyone is still dealing with a fucking plague, which I really thought would have been over by now. I said that like six months ago, but still. Um, back in August when I recorded this, we were living out of a hotel. We have since moved into our house. And it's fucking awesome. It is so nice. I've been saving for the down payment since I was 15. Megan kicked in a little cash and we were able to make it work. And now we have a home that we own. Well, that we'll own in 30 years. You know, mortgage and all that. Uh, but we have a place that we can call our own that we can just fuck up. Put holes in the walls, paint the rooms, we can do whatever we want. We painted one room, uh, three different, two different shades of blue, because that's what Megan wanted. So the bottom, the two-thirds, bottom maybe, I guess, third of the room is dark blue, and the top two-thirds is light blue. It looks beautiful. There's posts, there were pictures in the Discord like two months ago when we did it. Sorry for missing it. It's got the Discord link in the description. It's in every video now. Uh, in my room, we put up a, a pattern where we put tape on the wall in a sort of geometric formation and then painted the wall and peeled the tape off and the result was that the, you know, what's left behind is the white primer where the tape was covering it. And I created this almost symmetrical pattern. It's made out of like eight different line segments, but only two of them aren't symmetrical from one side to the other. And it's just asymmetrical enough it looks like a unique pattern that doesn't look like it's been mirrored, but it's just symmetrical enough that it sort of fades into the background and becomes part of the wall decoration rather than being like a place in the room that draws your eye. I'm gonna check that I'm recording. <laughs> I'm fucking around with the voice recording software in Windows, and they changed the way the UI works, and I'm not confident with it, but it looks like it's working. So we moved into our house. I, I set up a wood shop in the garage. Which has just been awesome. Uh, I'm gonna take a drink, I'll tell you about it. Meanwhile, we're gonna bounce belt off of you. Mmm, that's good. It's about half Diet Coke, half Amaretto. It's really sweet. I have a, I have a tongue for that. I really have a sweet tooth. So I made a wood chop in the garage. Uh, basically, I started with an empty garage, just Stud and, dry, stud and drywall walls, um, and I built workbenches, I built work surfaces, I built drawers, I built storage, I put up a pegboard, I got a table saw, I got a mobile workbench, I got all the stuff that I've been putting together, and it's been, it's been so great. I'm really enjoying doing woodworking. Previously, I'd only been able to do it by visiting uh, my in-laws. Uh, shop on um, uh, the ranch where I was married. Uh, that whole property is fucking awesome. It's so beautiful out there. But anyway, now that I finally have one uh, to call my own, uh, it's just so nice having that around. Being able to make things. I, I, I love making things, and I almost feel like... It, it gets into like the the philosophical almost, but I feel like the value of a person this isn't really how I feel, but it's a simplified version. The value of a person can be determined by the value of what they've created. And not just physical goods, also like the, how much they affect the world and how positively they affect the world. And it's just a small part of that is I love making things. Anything that I can put the pieces together and, and make. Like just finishing a jigsaw puzzle is satisfying. Making Let's Plays is more satisfying than just playing a video game. Because when you beat a video game, you're like, great, I did it, it's an achievement. Even if it, if it was very hard, all that, it's still great. It's still worth it. And it's still fun and enjoyable and a worthwhile activity. But doing that exact same thing and making a Let's Play of it, now not only did you get all that other stuff, you also made something. And to me, that makes it like a whole other level. So being able to make stuff like furniture that I want to be able to use for decades. It's super satisfying. Also, don't cast any elemental spells in this guy. It fucking heals him. Uh, even if you bounce them. <laughs> Just found that out. Thanks, Kamari. And so far, I've made Megan a new uh, desk. It's an L-shaped desk with wooden drawers. It's all uh, it's just a fucking beautiful. It came out so much better than my desk that I made like a year ago. Uh, because I learned a lot in the meantime. And I made her an artist's easel out of solid oak. 
because she's been learning to paint like Bob Ross. It's fucking awesome. Once I have some pictures of that to show you, I, I will. So far, none of her paintings, according to her, are up to like presentation quality. She's still in the learning phase, so I'll respect her and not show any of her uh, paintings yet. But once she makes a masterpiece, I'll, I'll, I'll let you guys see it. I'm, I'm going to be proud of it anyway. Uh, and then I also made, just we just finished it today, we made a, a catio, which is a cat patio. It's basically a multi-tiered coop, I guess would be the right word, like a chicken coop for our cat. And it goes on our back porch. And uh, Mr. B fucking loves it. It has three different levels that you can climb in between. And at the highest level, he's higher than the fence around our yard. So he can actually look into the other yards and like... <laughs> judge their pets. <laughs> oh, hey, Flan's dead. That took fucking forever. This is definitely a fight where getting your characters fucking amped and like leveled up beforehand is a good idea. And he drops magic spheres, which is absolutely fucking awesome. And I have no idea how I'm gonna edit this shit, because I just have one. <laughs> I just have one piece of footage running straight to the next piece of footage. I hope you guys don't mind that there's no transitions. I didn't think to do that in advance. You know what I can do right now, though, is I can go ahead and put transitions on the rest of them, because... Although I'm recording this, uh... Oh, fuck. <laughs> there we go. Although... <laughs> I just wiggled it around and lost track of the footage. Uh, although I'm recording... Shit. I'm recording this post-commentary, you know, I'm, I'm watching the footage back live for me as I record it. And so it's a little bit weird to go in and be adding transitions and shit between each episode, but that's what I'm doing right now. I'm zooming into each little clip, making sure it has a one second long transition to the one next to it. That way I can record all this live and have the transitions still be in there when the time comes. Boom, I think we're good. As long as I don't hit the space bar, we'll be fine. So now we're fighting the Nega Elemental which is basically only weak to magic, as far as I recall. Again, it's been two and a half months since I fought these guys. Sorry it took me so long to uh, actually put the commentary on this. But uh, you guys won't be seeing the episode until probably a week after this, so maybe longer. I've been meaning to upload an episode every day, but I keep forgetting, and Megan keeps forgetting, and it's just like, okay, whatever. But for all these elemental creatures, they're super resistant to physical attacks, and magic is the way to affect them. And this guy's actually, I think, easier than Jumbo Flan, because you don't have to bother with setting up the reflect and all that. You can just spam flare and hit this guy with a bunch of different spells and you're good to go. Oh my god, this video is an hour and ten minutes long. Holy shit. We're gonna be here for a hot minute. I'm taking another drink. That's real nice. So we moved into a new house. We painted the rooms the way we like. We have a little itty bitty backyard that's big enough for the dog. And we have a catio for the cat. We can sit on the back porch with both our animals. Everybody's enjoying the nice November weather in Texas. Uh, currently, the election has not yet been called. Um, like 90% or something of the electoral college has voted like shit's mostly decided but there's just enough left in like a few key states that we don't actually know and it's friday we've been waiting since tuesday for the fucking numbers to come in on this shit and we're still waiting it's like come on can this election be over already please seriously you guys will be hearing this well after the election so count your blessings hopefully this shit's not tied up in the supreme court for like another month <laughs> which i would not be surprised if that was the case Flashbacks at 2000. Oh boy. Anyway, that's not politics. But that's where the world is right now. Everything sucks, basically. <laughs> Just fucking plague, dude. Oh, apparently bouncing them off of uh, Yuna is our plane again. I don't know why. It doesn't seem a lot of damage. Maybe he set up a reflect. I'm not actually watching the footage. I don't fucking care. <laughs> this, we've reached the point in the game where only completionists and Final Fantasy fanatics will ever go. Because these mo any one of these monsters 
of our fighting in this stage of the arena is substantially stronger than the final boss of the game, like the plot game. Uh, so <laughs> that alone makes this this whole bit kind of meh. It's definitely in the optional category. But I gotta tell you, man, I'm excited to be uh, wrapping this game up. I just recently completed the sphere grid, totally like max that shit out. I don't even know. I don't think. I don't remember if Kamari has been there yet. I don't. I don't think he is. Uh, one of these clips will probably show the sphere grid at some point. I'm sure that's the case, right? Right. You wouldn't forget to do that, would you? I guess we'll find out when time comes. So we got a house, we painted the rooms. The pets are happy. I'm happy. Megan's happy. And it just, it's hunky door. I got a new job. We're back in Texas. I like my job. I like my boss. I like my boss's boss, who I see more often than my boss. Because my boss is remote, lives in a different city. And my boss's boss is not remote and works about 20 feet away from me. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> it's sort of strange because it's like, if I have questions and stuff, I'm supposed to, I am this guy who lives in a different city. But if I want to actually get an answer like immediately, where I can talk to somebody, I just get up and walk over and talk to his boss. <laughs> it's like, eh, whatever. But uh, I like it a lot. And I won't really get into the details of it, just for privacy reasons. But suffice to say, I'm still doing IT. And out of the three jobs that I've had in my life, this is by far the best one. Just in terms of the situation I'm in in my life and how it enables that and the work environment, the salary, the benefits, the lifestyle. Uh, even with everybody being fucking quarantined, it's still it's still the best job so far. It'll be nicer, and everything else will be nicer, once this shit's over. Fingers crossed, man. Uh, it's hard not to think about it. It's weird, because we've been in quarantine since February, and it's basically just become the new normal. And it's so fucked up that's the case. So fucked up. It's like... The country is spiking right now. Our city is spiking, the state is spiking, and the country is spiking. So like at every level, shit's bad. Today we had, uh, as a nation, an all-time record for most reported new cases. 120,000. And I'm sorry to be a bummer, but that's just what's on my mind today. It's like... Fuck, dude. Like, I just want to watch hentai. Can't life be simple again? <laughs> Can't things just go back to high school where my my biggest concern was trying to get my high school girlfriend to fuck me? Which she never did, by the way. God damn it. I was blue-balled for four years. It's been 84 years. I might have to re-record this because when I listen back to it, I'll realize I was too drunk. Eh, I don't think so. Come on, Nega Elemental. I can see from the footage that your clip is almost over. It's time for you to die. <laughs> Double cast. Flare. Flare. Boom. Time to die. Elemental de Nega. I saw a clip today on YouTube of the Fairly Odd Parents, where the Crimson Chin had an adversary, an, like sort of a an opposite. Um, that was called the Nega Chin. <laughs> but <laughs> the, when the first when he first showed up and someone yelled, "Oh my God! It's the Nega Chin!" The, the way that their voice worked out, it sounded like they said the N-word, Chin. And it was like, ooh. Ouch. <laughs> you think somebody would have caught that? Somewhere in post-production, the editor would have been like, wow, it really sounds like the voice like, really sounds like the voice actor said the N-word here. Maybe we should just take this out. Change it or something. Nope. That shit went on Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 and Nick, Nick, Nick. Nick the N-word. Yeah, maybe I should have caught that. I am fully convinced that these fucking click when it's in the middle of the bar things 
are 100% horseshit, and I have yet to actually do the analysis, but I'm convinced that a lot of the time, that little slider goes past the hot zone in the middle without actually there being a frame where it's in that zone. Almost like Mario, like, going so fast through his BLJ that he clips through doors and shit. I think that that bar slides back and forth so quickly that sometimes there is no frame where it's in the hot zone. And if I can find that footage, I'll put it in one of these videos because I have pretty good timing. And I record this footage sober, to my credit. Um, I remember going to, I think it was a science museum when I was a kid. And they had uh, a whole bunch of cool displays. My favorite was this, uh, basically this big fan that blew air out of the tube, maybe the size of a large garbage can. They created this column of moving air above it. And you could put a beach ball in that column of air. And instead of getting blown away and like blowing off, you know, to the side, that moving air demonstrated, that column demonstrated that moving air, uh, the faster a fluid is moving, the less pressure it exerts. So you could put a beach ball on top of this, this fan and blowing through a garbage can, and the beach ball would get blown up, but it would also get like sucked in to this column of moving air, and as a result would become sort of vapor locked above the display, and it was so freaking cool, dude. Anyway, that same museum had an area where you could test your reaction time. It just had a big button, and you push one, and then you'd wait, and as soon as a light came on, you'd smack the other button as fast as possible. And my reaction time was like three tenths of a second or something. Granted, that was like 15 years ago, but it can't have gotten that much worse. I'm not even 30 yet. So it's probably still pretty good. Which means that that little slidey bar, I'm calling shenanigans on that shit. I miss that shit way too much for it to be an actual timing thing. I think it's more like those... Did I just go through an entire flight without talking about it? Yeah, fuck it. Uh, it's more like one of those light games that you find at a Chuck E. Cheese or uh, an arcade where it has that circular display uh, with three different places with buttons on it and a little light going really fast in a circle of lights around the edge of the table. I need to try and smack the button right as the light goes through one individual bulb in front of the button. And it seems like nine out of ten times when you get it and you feel like you just, you dialed it in, you nailed it, the light just goes eh, like, oh, you missed by one. Oh, too early. Oh, too late. Mark Rover did a video on that shit. It's absolutely rigged. And I think this shit is too. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs> Are you drinking gin and tonic, Cog? See, for like 99% of you, that was like, what? But for one of you, that was a WHOA moment. <laughs> you better DM me on Discord when you watch this. <laughs> I need my satisfaction. <laughs> oh, man. Why does this guy remind me of something? This, this boss that we're fighting here, um... Gosh, what is his name? Fafnir? Yeah. He's the boss of all the drakes. And I'm trying to remember... Yeah, this is the guy who can drop um, no encounters weapons. So if you didn't get one from Geos Gano, the fish with the cage in its chest uh, that we fought... that we ran away from in the very first episode and then we fought again later. Um, oh, look, we're all immune. Great. Uh... You can actually fight this guy, and he can drop no encounters weapons. So if you're looking to get that Baroque sword for Titus, there you go. Let's see if we got one here. Vindicate myself. Elemental arm blade. Nope. I suppose it isn't a hundred percent chance. I'm gonna look that up just to make sure I'm right about it. Now right, we beat Fafnir. Now we're gonna fight Sleep Sprout. Sleep Sprout is one of the weirdest uh, enemies in that once you get to a certain level, it just becomes really easy. Like, really easy. Let's see. No, he drops weapons with different strike abilities. 
Who is it that has the no encounter weapons then? I'm gonna look it up right now. FFX. Did we just lose? <laughs> I'm not even paying that much attention. No encounter. Oh god. Encounter weapon. Ooh, a game fax from 2014. That should be great. Great! Ba -ba 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 -ba. <laughs> yep, that's useless. Let's try and find a more recent one. Ooh, Jagged! I don't know why, but Jagged.com is like the best way to go. Okay, so you capture all the drakes. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, right, 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 right. He doesn't drop no encounters weapons, he drops purifying salt. And you can use Purifying Salt to customize an armor to have the No Encounters ability. I knew I was, I knew I was thinking of something like that. God, Dan is so fucking hot. One of the game grumps. Don't, don't ask me about it in the comments. We beat. <laughs> we just beat. <laughs> I'm paying attention. The Sleep Sparrow. He has such a small amount of health compared to the rest of these boss monsters. It's kind of weird that he's even in this category. But, mm, say love you, man. You gotta live when you when you when you can live, eh? Sleep Sprout. He just like, killed him in three hits. I'm pretty sure that uh, Boss Bomb out here, Bomb King, whatever the fuck his name is, uh, is in a similar category. So I'm just gonna spend like a minute over preparing and then go in and kill him. The one thing that bothers me in this game is that when enemies are immune to an ability, they say immune even if. The attack that you used, like full break, applies multiple breaks. So if it applies armor break, power break, mental blight break, and magic break? What's the fourth one? I don't remember. Uh, if it's immune to one of those, that little immune sign will appear after you would do the attack. Even if the other three all got applied. And so you see that and you're like, oh, he's immune to that stuff. Whereas, really it's like, oh, three out of four works, he's just immune to one of them. I kind of wish that you could see them separately, but I don't know. Maybe it adds too much. Oh, when Titus does this Blitz Ace Ultimate, pay attention to who's tossing the Blitz Ball up to him. Because apparently, the person that tosses up the Blitz Ball to Titus is the lady in the party with whom Titus has the closest relationship. And I had no idea that this was a thing the game tracked, but apparently, you get slightly different cutscenes a couple times during the game based on whoever Titus's closest companion is. Even though the game sort of ships Titus and Yuna, the game, like the plot I mean, the game itself actually keeps track of, of, of that, of it separately. And so you can find a couple places where it shows up. One of them is, if you remember, Oh, this is gonna this is going back a couple months for me. Um, we were going to the last temple uh, in the frozen area after we fought the Albed machine on the frozen lake and brother was there and all that shit. We we rode on snow what are they called snowmobiles, I guess. Um, and Titus and in our case, Lulu rode together on a snowmobile. With Lulu sitting sideways because her ridiculous belt dress wouldn't allow her to face forwards. Uh, apparently, in that cutscene, Titus rides alongside with whoever he has the closest relationship with. And then also, in his Blitz Ace Ultimate, the person he has the female he has the closest relationship with will toss the Blitz Ball up to him for him to spike. So just a little note, and I think that the person that that is changed. I guess it. I guess it went through every possibility, because here in these earlier fights it's Lulu, and then eventually it switches to Riku because we did a bunch of fights with Riku and Titus together later on, and then I think after that it switched to Yuna. And the, one of the things that. I guess I should say, one of the things that affects how close their relationship is, is how many fights they've been in together. And so if you're grinding with a certain party of three, and it includes Titus and a lady, it's going to increase their like, uh, connectedness factor, or whatever the hell it is in the background, that decides 
which one of the three he likes the best. Honestly, I'm just disappointed that we can't see Titus fuck Waka. Because Waka fucks. I'm just gonna let that one hang so you guys can think about it. <laughs> He's a guardian? That has to be like the most impressive profession. He's an athlete. Granted, his team always loses, but he is the captain of the team. It's worth something. It's like being the lead singer in a really shitty band. <laughs> Ambushed! Oh, fuck! Okay, this is Ironclad. Ironclad's an asshole. You can hit him with an armor break, but most of the time it won't... I think this is him. Most of the time it won't stick. You have to get lucky. I think it's like a 10% chance. So what you can do, instead of using the armor break ability on Titus or whoever... Oh, and we're all dead. <laughs> Cut this out! Cut this! Put a job, Poncho! What are you doing? Nah, we'll just go back in. Um, well, no, we're gonna do something else. What the fuck are we doing right now? What is happening in this footage? Alright, we're scrolling. Okay, we're making some armor for Waka. Yeah, yeah, what do we got? What do we got? Yeah, we got, um... We got confusion. We got scrolling. Auto Phoenix. Ah, okay, so now Waka and Tidus both have Auto Phoenix armor. So if one of them gets knocked out, they'll revive uh, the other. And vice versa. Although in that fight, I think all three got knocked out at the same time, so it doesn't actually matter. Anyway, armor break will only stick to this guy like 10% of the time. The rest of the time, it just won't take. But if you use Riku, her overdrive mix is super, super versatile. And depending on who you ask, the final end game party can often include Riku. Even though she's the last person you unlock and it sort of feels like she's the least powerful and has like utility abilities, that really comes into, into its, its, uh, its value in the late late game because a lot of those utilities are, well, useful. Including her overdrive, her mix ability to mix together two items and create some interesting effect has a lot of different things that it can do. But one of the things that she can do that's the easiest to get access to is, is to create a frag grenade. A frag grenade will do damage to the enemy. Not much, like a few hundred, it's negligible. But the big thing is, it will 100% of the time inflict armor break on the enemy. And all you need to do to make uh, a frag grenade with her mix ability is mix together two power spheres. So if you get Riku, charge your overdrive meter, go to mix, and choose two power spheres, she'll throw a frag grenade that always inflicts armor break, reducing the opponent's defense to minimum levels. And that is really, just by far, the best way to fight bosses like Ironclad, that are super hard to get armor break on normally, but aren't actually immune to it. So you avoid that 10% chance and go straight to the fuck you. What else is new in our house? Uh, the last couple days I've been working on a jigsaw puzzle. I've been posting pictures to Discord. And, uh... Holy shit, is it a pain in the ass. It's made out of laser-cut acrylic. Which is a clear, about 5 mil thick material. Almost like plastic glass, basically. That's how I think of acrylic, it's like plastic glass. It's clear and hard and has sharp edges like glass, but it doesn't break like plastic, for the most part. And this laser cut acrylic is... The pieces are like 10 mil across, they're so small. And it's 144 pieces. It has... The first thing I did when I laid it out was like, okay, it's a jigsaw puzzle. I'll do the edges first. Easy. I laid it out. Fucker has eight corners and way too many edge pieces. <laughs> It's just like, God damn it! <laughs> Alright, Lulu is still tossing the ball to Titus. 
and I'm fucking blowing it. <laughs> I miss Titus's overdrive a lot. Don't judge me. I'm convinced it's rigged. You can. You can write a letter to your senator. Complaining about that. As far as walk-ups overdrive goes, I have a method that works for me about 99% of the time. Which, if I think about it, we might get to see here, but Lucky keeps fucking dying. So the method basically is, but for the first two reels on Waka's attack reels, it's just timing. Like, you just gotta look at it and click at the right time. And because it alternates between one hit and two hit, for one, it, that, that makes it pretty easy, because it means the range that you have to hit is two slots wide, or two uh, stickers wide. Which makes it twice as easy, or half as hard. Anyway. And then, for the third one, I'll take my time. That's the real secret. Take your time. With Waka's Overdrive, they give you like 20 seconds or something like that in order to click and stop all three reels. And that's a lot of time for his Overdrive, because the first two should only take you like five, maybe eight seconds. Uh, what it means for the last reel, the hardest one, which has the no hits, the misses basically on it, you actually have the ability to take your time and see it. So here it is here. So for the first two, it's just timing. And for the third one, what I'll do is I'll watch, I'll watch the two hit, I figured this out after this before, I'll watch the two hit go by a few times and I'll count in my head as it goes past sort of timing it mentally, and I'll count to four. So I'll see it go by three times, one, two, three, and then on the fourth one, I'll click, I'll press the button to select it. So I go one, two, three, and that gets it for me almost always. I miss it occasionally, BAC comes into it as a factor in that, but you know, almost always it's gonna hit, because you get the timing in your head and you sort of feel that rhythm and it becomes less an issue of trying to look at it and time it and more an issue of just feeling in your head, in your internal metronome how often that 2x comes past. A lot of good pro tips in this episode of Drunk Post Commentary. Gotta say, I think this- oh fuck, we almost died. I think this video deserves a like. Maybe you should like, comment, and subscribe. <laughs> YouTube is such a fucking cesspool now. Maybe I should put my face in the thumbnails. I can just be screaming and everything. <laughs> you know? It's funny because that's a criticism from like three years ago and it's still fucking accurate. <sighs> I guess if I want to get featured on YouTube now, I have to go on The Tonight Show. I remember finding Chugga Conroy's YouTube channel because he got featured on the front page of YouTube. It's like eight years ago, maybe? God, probably like ten years ago. There is no front page of YouTube now. It's all suggestions and recommendations and fucking Jimmy Fallon. Ugh. Ugh. Jimmy fucking Fallon. Oh, no. Alright, who's next? Catastrophe? Let's fly Catastrophe next. Earth Eater. Oh wait, no, it's Earth Eater. <laughs> He's- OH SHIT! <sighs> Alright, Earth Eater's an asshole. He's got pretty high defense. And he's based on the improved version of that boss of the uh, El Chocobo Cabra that we fought on the Jose High Road, remember that? Ages ago? Back when Yuna, um... Wait, <laughs> I can't remember if we've seen it yet or not. I can't remember if I'm spoiling things. I don't think we've seen that yet, Never mind. Anyway, back on the Jose High Road, <laughs> with El Chocobo Cabra. Come on, get it. Yeah, 12 hits. You can see when that finished, it had 14 and a half seconds left, so there's no rush on that ability. That's the real secret. Take your time. Count it out. Bada bing. Bada boom. That's it. Just that's only that's it. Bada bing bada boom. There's no third thing. Why is there no third thing? 
Oh shit. <laughs> I love how <laughs> the boss is just like, fuck you, fuck you. Megaton Punch is basically a kill this character attack. Yeah, and this guy's immune to a lot of abilities. But like El Chocobo Cabra, once we deal enough damage to him, he's gonna roll onto his back and basically be vulnerable. There he goes. But the funny thing is, now instead of counterattacking every attack with a Megaton Punch, he's gonna shoot a flare out of his ass. <laughs> It's magic, I ain't gonna explain shit. <laughs> Why is he shoot a flare out of his ass? Anyway, once he's on his back like a sad turtle, his defenses go down. So this is the point where they de well, they don't go away, they decrease. So this is the point where you would want to apply your overdrives and your strong abilities and whatever else you're saving up. It's still Lulu. God damn, I hate that overdrive. I miss that like half the time. Even after the dozens of hours of playtime I have after this recording, I still miss that shit like half the time. It is super annoying. Either it's rigged, or there's enough input delay that it makes it so you have to go super early. Because it feels like the only time I get it is when I deliberately go for it super early. Luck, I just get wrecked by a flare every single time. <laughs> yeah, Kimari. Get from that nine 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 nine. That was one too many nines. One of those was a German for no. Kimari had been the nine 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 nine. Yeet! I love how every flare just immediately kills someone, and without the auto phoenix armor, we would be absolutely wrecked. No chance. That's the big reason we put the auto phoenix armor on Waka, so armor. Also, Waka is not doing max damage like the other two characters. Do. That is just a I feel like I've spent an, an inordinate amount of money during this boss grind, just buying fucking Phoenix Downs, man. Because there's so many bosses like this one, where every time you attack them, they counterattack with an ability that instantly kills somebody, and there goes another Phoenix Down. I'm a little concerned, because I can see in the recording that there is a quiet spot <laughs> coming up in like a minute, <laughs> which makes me think that I died. <laughs> Oh uh, no. I'm sure it's- I'm just imagining it. We'll definitely win. I mean, look at all the Phoenix Downs we have, we can't lose. As long as no attack does damage to all three, it's literally impossible. As long as there's one person left, they'll revive the other two. And look! Now he's on his back! All he can do is shit flares at us! It's still- it- even after like the 20 hours I spent grinding this guy, because this motherfucker drops fortune spheres. And if you recall, fortune spheres are the sphere that you need. We're out of Phoenix Downs, by the way. That's why Waka's not reviving them. <laughs> oh no. Fuck! <laughs> Alright, I'll spare you the, the, the effort and we'll just skip ahead um, to the next time we fought this guy. Oh fuck, I'm gonna have a hell of a time lining this up. Here we are, fighting the next Earth Eater. We're back basically in the same place. Where... Uh, we, he's almost dead. But this time we have many, many more Phoenix Downs. Yeah, you can tell the difference in his defenses because Titus is only doing 30,000. Instead of 900. 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. Or 8, 6, whatever. Kamari's doing the max damage. Go on you, Kamari. Get in there and kick his ass, Kamari. Yeah! What an asshole. This guy drops... Fortune Spheres. Which are the red sphere required to fill in 
luck spheres on the grid. The next boss we're going to fight, the greater sphere, is the one that actually drops luck spheres. That was me clicking to indicate where the transition is so I can sync my audio for later. If I tell you it's breaking the fourth wall and not being unprofessional, there's a difference. Oh, why the fuck is this episode called the Greater Sphere? It's failed. Fuck the fucking shit. All right, so now we're fighting Greater Sphere. This asshole actually drops Luck Spheres, which are required to increase your character's luck by creating new luck nodes on the sphere grid. Wow, it feels like a fucking tongue twister. We need to fight the greater sphere to get luck spheres to create more nodes for luck nodes that we can unlock with fortune spheres on the sphere grid. <laughs> like, if you haven't played Final Fantasy, that makes no fucking sense whatsoever. Also, what is Lulu doing in this party? What are you doing, Lulu? No, seriously, what's Lulu doing here? Uh, basically, this guy is a huge pain in the ass, and he will respond to any physical attack by casting Ultima on your whole party, which I'm pretty sure at this point would almost kill my team, and he, would res res he will respond to any magic attack with a physical attack called Hydraulic Press, which he just did, which does, I think, 85%? It's based as, as a percentage of your max health. 85% of your max health. Of course, with the white uh, wind or whatever, Mighty Guard protecting us here, uh, we only take half that because we have a protect and a shell. So in this case, 85% becomes 42.5% of our max HP. So we're all left with somewhere over 5,000. And that's the news. So basically right now, we're getting set the fuck up on Greater Sphere. And Greater Sphere is a fucking asshole. Mostly I just like him because for, mo for most of the stats on the Sphere Grid, you only have to fight one boss in order to upgrade that stat. So if you want more accuracy, you fight the boss that drops accuracy spheres. Easy. If you want more luck, you have to fight Greater Sphere who drops the Luck Sphere to create the Sphere Node. And then you have to fight um, Earth Eater, who drops the Fortune Sphere to unlock the Sphere Node and actually get the plus four luck. That make sense? No? Didn't think so. It's a pain in the ass is the answer, basically, because whereas most spheres on the Sphere Grid, most nodes on the Sphere Grid are activated by the basic spheres of Speed, agility, mana, power, that kind of thing. Uh, instead, this one stat, luck. You have to have special luck nodes and special fortune spheres in order to actually increase that stat. And it's a huge pain in the ass. So I have fought Greater Sphere now way too many fucking times. I think I did the math. Because I've, I've finished out maxing out the Sphere Grid as as of my recording of this post-commentary. And that means that everybody's stats are at 255. Well, not everybody, just Titus. But was, um, at least for luck. And each node only gives you plus 4. So to get to 255, which is basically 256, that's 64 plus 4 nodes. So with an overdrive, or an over overkill, you get double the drops, which means that when you overkill a greater sphere, you get two luck spheres, which creates two luck nodes, which is plus eight luck, which is one thirty second of the total amount of luck you need. So if you want to max out luck for a character, you have to fight greater sphere 32 times and get an overkill every time, and then you have to fight Earth Eater 32 times and get an overkill every time. And then fill out the sphere grave with enough sphere levels that you get from farming Don Tomberry, and I want to fucking die. <laughs> this is, I spent way too much time on this shit. And that is why it's taken me two and a half months to get around this motherfucking video. <laughs> oh boy. He's losing it, folks. He is losing it. So, the good news is. 
greater sphere is susceptible to overdrives and I don't know how strong Anima is in this recording, but as of today, this overdrive Oblivion with Anima does over, yeah, 600,000 damage, which is like a third of uh, Greater Sphere's health. Unfortunately, uh, Hydraulic Press is coded to deal 85% of your maximum HP, which means if the boss decides to Hydraulic Press twice, you're automatically dead because that's 170% of your maximum, which is more than 100, which means you're dead. Oops. Also, Lulu's Overdrive gauge is still full because we haven't loot, we haven't used Lulu's Overdrive because Lulu's Overdrive fucking blows. Is the worst overdrive ever. So most characters, if they get a multi-hit overdrive like Titus or Waka, um, that means they're getting their. He's <laughs> healed by Holy. Uh, that means they're getting their full damage of a regular attack action applied multiple times to the overdrive. For whatever reason, Lulu's overdrive Fury divides the damage by I think four? I think it's like 25%. So if you spin the thumbstick as fast as you fucking can, which by the way is not one to one with the multiplier you get on her overdrive, the more powerful the spell, the more times you have to spin the thumbstick in order to get another multiplier point on Lulu's overdrive multiplier uh, for Fury. So basically, her overdrive automatically comes with like a 75% nerf which is absolute fucking bullshit, and basically means it's not really an overdrive. You're not really a multi-hit ability. Because whereas Titus can hit 9 times with Blitz Ace, and Waka can hit 12 times with a perfect um, attack reels, Lulu's overdrive maxes out, I think, at 9 or 10 Fury. But because each of those is only like a quarter of the damage, it's really like 2. Which is not impressive for an overdrive. So yeah, sorry Lulu, your belt dress is fucking hilarious, but your overdrive sucks. And then we all sat back and watched the Ultima animation. If you sat through this entire fucking video with my ridiculously drunk commentary, post a banana in the comments. I mean, the word banana. I found this new YouTube channel recently called Karen Puzzles, and it's literally just a lady in LA who likes jigsaw puzzles and makes videos about jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> Stop it! You already tried Holy! It heals him! What's wrong with you? Fucking idiot! There you go, I saved you from making that comment. So now you can say something nice. Tell me what you've accomplished in the last couple of months. What's changed in your life? What are you proud of? What are you happy about? What are you excited about? It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood. It makes me sad that uh, Mr. Rogers and Bob Ross are dead. And again, Hitler is also dead, so I guess you take the good with the bad. Honestly, if Hitler were still around today, he'd only be speaking German, and I can't understand that shit, so... It wouldn't bother me as much, listening to the shit he does. Because it would all be going through like a translator. And it would still be fucking terrible. But I imagine the translator would struggle to convey the hatred in the, uh, original speaker's voice. Much like the, uh, <laughs> Much... Unlike... The sign language interpreter for Eminem concerts, who is on the fucking ball and is somewhere between sign language and interpretive dance as she lays out with her palms the beauty that is Eminem's um, flow in his raps. Like, <laughs> if you haven't seen this, you gotta look it up. Look it up on YouTube. Look up Eminem sign language interpreter. He has a sign language lady that does his concerts, and she is the bomb. She Not only is she doing the sign language to say what he is speaking, she also has like the same kind of 
flow that he has and the same rhythm and she's almost dancing out the sign language. It's so cool. I feel like dancing while you communicate through sign language is sort of like speaking from ignorance here is sort of like singing something uh, that, that's spoken. It's both conveying information and it's an art form. That is so fucking beautiful, dude. Even if it's just the lyrics to Rap God. <laughs> uh, which, uh, by itself, I would not call a thing of beauty. It's just a rap song. I mean, it's okay. It's fine. It's not a thing of beauty like Dust in the Wind or Misty Mountains. I was listening to that uh, Misty Mountains song from the Hobbit movies, which... The movie sucked. The best thing about that first Hobbit film was the Misty Mountains up a cappella with all the dwarves. So many bass singers. So satisfying. But I was listening to them, and I was listening to a couple uh, different interpretations of it, some performances. One of them was by a Danish orchestral group. Let's see if I can find the exact name. But, um, God, I love that song so much, and the way that this group was performing it was amazing. Yeah, it's performed by the Danish National Symph Symphony Orchestra. You can find it on YouTube. Just search Misty Mountain Danish Symphony Orchestra, and you'll find a video that's uh, 3 minutes and 58 seconds long of this amazing bass singer. Like... Not baritone, bass. This guy's voice is so low and so resonant. Like hearing him hit some of these notes, it is awesome. I'm literally listening to it and getting chills. So fucking good. It's a combination of an outstanding vocal performance mixed with an orchestral accompaniment on top of the fact that the lyrics themselves Tell wow, we almost all died there. It's okay, everything's fine. We're using Mega Phoenix. On top of the fact that the lyrics themselves tell the tale of a people um, estranged from their ancestral homeland, who are now forced to attempt a near suicide mission in hopes that they can one day reclaim their forefathers' uh, land and, and their birthright, literally gave me chills. Like. I don't get ASMR, whatever the fuck that is, auto sensory meridian response, something, something, I don't fucking know what it stands for. I don't get the heebie jeebies from videos of people whispering shit in my ear. That just makes me feel like I have a friend who doesn't understand my personal space. <laughs> but listening to those kind of songs, that kind of music, that gives me that response. That is what runs a chill down my spine. Wild, dude. So cool. If you, don't, if you did not look that up, even if you haven't seen the movie, you gotta check it out. It is so cool. Are we still playing Final Fantasy? Like, what's what's happening here? Can you guys just smack the water blob, please? Please, can we be done? <laughs> I have everybody's overdrive mode set to Victor, or rather, uh, Warrior, so that as they deal damage, their overdrive will charge, so that way I can use it multiple times in a fight. Um, once your characters are super, super maxed out, Warrior is not a great mode to pick because honestly you're going to be one and two shotting most things, and so the damage you deal is kind of secondary. Anyway, I hope you guys have enjoyed this stupidly long episode of Final Fantasy X. In the next episode, we're going to have a couple more archival footage of me fighting a couple bosses. And then we're going to get into the new territory with live commentary. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Post bananas. <laughs>